Hey, podcast listeners. Oh, wow, I completely stole that from Ira Glass. Yeah, no one tell them about that. Hey, uh, stay tuned at the end of the show after the closing music for a plug for one of my favorite podcasts, TBTL with Luke Burbank and Andrew Walsh. Or if you don't want to listen to 20 minutes of me talking out my ass, you can find the link at the show bottom of the show page. Uh, but listen to the long one. It's better that way. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you got offended by tits in Times Square, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is the Sunday, September 7th, 2015, Elmar Lack Boobies local edition of the show where we talk about the nearly naked painted ladies of Times Square and why some people are so very upset over them. Stay tuned. The What the Hell Were You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Anthony's Fund for Retired Pushes and Tits. Hey, do you guys remember the good old days when a man could make a living in Times Square? Junkies, whores, bums, you know, when it was a nice place to hang out. It's not like the day with these fucking crazy muppets beating the shit out of each other, pashmina fucking guys whacking each other with the signs, the kids selling the CDs, hustling the tourists. It's not like it was, I tell you that. Anthony's Funds for Retired Pushes and Pimps provides for those of you who lost your livelihood to fucking Giuliani in the 90s. Anthony's. Because we was trying to make an honest living, you pal. If you would like to sponsor the show, head on down to Times Squares and give your fucking money to some dude dressed like Mario. You'd get a lot more out of you for your fucking effort. When I was 18 years old in November of 1964, a freshman at Georgetown, I first went to Times Square. I bought a, ta- a steak at Tad's Steakhouse. I heard a guy ream his mother out, poor working woman, because she'd given him a hi-fi instead of a stereo speaker. I remember everything about it. I saw a hooker approach a man in a gray flannel suit. It's pretty heavy stuff for a guy from Arkansas. Look, I still have vivid memories of it. Romantic, fascinating. This is one of those dumbass stories that's about nothing. It's about it being, you know, the end of summer. There's nothing really going on. You can only talk Trump for so long before the... People are just going to go, seriously, we're tired of hearing about this fucking guy. So you come up with a story that is basically nothing, because yeah, you can stir some shit up with that, and that's exactly the case with this. The desnudas, or the naked ladies of Times Square, are just another continuation of hustling tourists out of their money. Except in this case, it's women that are topless and have their nipples painted. Which, I don't see that there's anything wrong with that. God. Yes, dear listeners, there are semi-naked women in Times Square. I know. Apparently the law allows this travesty against the children because of some stupid ruling by a judge that says women can do anything a man can do. Well, not anything. I mean, they can't, like, make the same amount of money for the same amount of work. But at least they can go around topless anywhere a man could legally show his hairy man tits. So there you go, ladies. Stop asking for things like an equal chance to compete in the workplace. You get to show your nipples in public. Now, as you might imagine, some people are not very happy about this. Some people are upset because nearly naked women are there to be seen by children who clearly shouldn't be exposed to anything like the human body before they're legally old enough to consent to have sex. They can watch people getting blown to bits and blood gored and guts and veins in their teeth, but hey, no tits! And the tabloids, the dear (laughs) Daily News and the Post, managed to find as many as three or four people, and we assume they're not the same people, but in a situation like this that's always possible, who objected to mammary glands in the theme park we now call Times Square. The objectors that were found were, (laughs) and this will come as no surprise to any native New Yorker, all tourists. I did not see that coming! People who come to New York, and particularly to Times Square, come for a specific idea of New York City and Times Square, and the sight of scantily clad women just doesn't mesh with the clean, wholesome image her, her, this, of the city her visitors have come to expect. No, what people want to see is a milk toast, homogenized version of corporate America with lots of lights and a 3,000% markup. They want an M&M store, a Bubba Gump Shrimp Factory. Die, you sweetly retarded cat! Now maybe it's just me, but I believe we're going to have to get medieval on your buttocks. 
They want an Applebee's or Disney store. People want Times Square to be like home, only bigger, brighter, and way more expensive. And there ain't no women flashing boobies on the streets of Waterville, Ohio. I'll have you know that right now, sir. As a New Yorker, and since I've survived a city in this decade, I'm legally allowed to call myself a New Yorker, or that's the story I'm sticking with for the purposes of this podcast, the nearly naked women are the least offensive thing in Times Square, in order from most to least offensive, tourists with selfie sticks, tourists with maps, just plain tourists, costume characters, CD vendors, tour bus leaflet wavers, the comedy show guys, and Smelly Ellie, the homeless lady on 44th and 7th, whom you can smell at least three blocks away, way down at the bottom of the list are the nearly naked ladies. Times Square is a horrific shit show of clogged sidewalks, tacky merchandise, gawking tourists, and commercial cancers blossoming like nodules on my liver as I finish this glass of Jameson. The boobs are basically the only honest thing in Times Square. Though Smelly Ellie can tell it like it is when she's having a good day, mostly though she just thinks she's that nurse that kisses the sailor in the old World War II photograph. So if she comes running towards you, it's vitally important that you sprint in the opposite direction. And what the hell is that smell? New York City Mayor Bill... I've made a huge mistake. 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 You've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. Be honest, Michael. The biggest little mistake I've ever made. I've made a huge tiny mistake. I've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. Job, I've made a huge mistake. You can bail yourself out next time. <laughs> I've never admitted to a mistake. <laughs> De Blasio has vowed he's going to do something about the painted ladies haunted our most precious life, a suburban mall food court in the center of the city. That's great, Mr. Mayor. Good to know, since we're still waiting on police reform, affordable housing, a minimum wage increase, transit infrastructure and funding, and there was something about carriage horses that I personally don't give a shit about, but I... Well, I'll guarantee you re it's gonna come around and bite you in the ass come time for re-election, because those fuckers forget nothing. Look, Bill D., we, got, we get it. You, you made some promises, and then Cuomo shit and shafted you at every turn. I get it. Come on. Tits doesn't even belong on the list, you know? Yeah. It's such a friendly-sounding word. See, here's the pro problem with New York City today. And most of you fuckers coming here from East Small Town, Indiana, where Frank the Barber gives foot rubs to strangers, no one locks their doors, and Mrs. Timerson, the third grade teacher, grows some killer shit in her hydro shed. Some of her sativas take the skull off your fucking head, man. No, New York isn't like that. Where you, it isn't like where you come from. Stop trying to make it into a bigger, more crowded, infinitely more expensive version of your hometown, no matter how kind Mrs. Timerson's bud might be. A few years ago, Times Square was a post-apocalyptic shithole of drugs, crime, prostitution, and the Port Authority bus terminal, which is the worst of a lot. There were topless women then, too, but they were sucking guys off behind the recruiting station, and no one even noticed. If you wanted to see boobs, you could step into some of the most squalid porn theaters ever to blossom and fester on the face of the earth. These places were literally herpes sores on the streets of NYC, just brushing up against them while walking past Rick's wrist coming down with a flaming case. New Yorkers avoided Times Square because it was dangerous, dirty, dark, Dark, depressing, and directly adjacent to the Port Authority bus terminal, which is, was, and still is, exponentially worse than Times Square. The Deuce, as it was called, was the grimmest place in the grimmest city in the United States. I mean, have you seen Escape from New York? Shit, that was cast with extras from actual people in Times Square because they wouldn't need the costuming. New York, 1997. The entire city is a walled maximum security prison. The bridges are mined. The rivers are patrolled. And the United States police force has everything under control. And all 
of this being true, if you ask a New Yorker who experienced the deuce back in the day, they will almost invariably say they miss it. Think about that for a second. Modern-day Disney-fied Times Square is so bad that New Yorkers would rather have junkies, pimps, and prostitutes. Yeah. The nearly nakeds are hardly the most aggressive panhandlers in the square. Fucking Elmo goes off on racist rants, Cookie Monster gropes a teenage girl, and the sheer number of children's movie and television characters running around there accosting every goddamn pedestrian who has to get from point A to point B is just pathetic. It's like Disney World if everyone in the park was hooked on smack. God help the tourist who takes a photo without dropping, I was going to say a buck, but usually it's more like ten. Once upon a time, I used to slip down to the square for a little bit, for a little bit of street photography. Now, if I even fucking flash a camera, I get mobbed by many mouses who think I just took a photo, demanding I render unto them like they were motherfucking Caesar. I mean, this this entire thing's a bullshit story anyway. It's made up by and for the tabloid readers of the city. The Post and the News invented this story out of whole cloth, which is status quo for the tabs. But then the New York Times jumped on the booby train as well, publishing story after story about this non-story. And no one who matters thinks it matters. And frankly, the tourists don't care. And they don't get a say. Stay here, pay rent, pay taxes, live with the shit I live with every day. Then you can come to talk to me about the boobies in Times Square. Until then, shut the fuck up and give the nice lady five dollars for ogling her tits like you just were. What are you looking at? My eyes are up here. No, no. This is a story about the newspapers not liking Bill de Blasio and making shit as hard for him as he can. It's about Cuomo, who hates Bill de Blasio making sure nothing de Blasio champions goes anywhere. It's the petty bullshit of New York politics, which makes three first graders fighting over a pudding cup seem like reasoned discourse by comparison. You know, look, I couldn't stand Bloomberg. And I, but damn, if he wouldn't have just blown right past this stupid non-story by making some reporter cry. His sign translator would just be giving the finger to the whole crowd. Which is a visual joke, and I guess that really doesn't work on a podcast. Just use your imagination for once, all right? Look, if you're a visitor in our fine city and you're personally offended by boobs, I urge you to vote with your dollars and feet. Leave. Take your money. Go elsewhere. Salt Lake City is lovely, and I assure you, you will not be exposed to a breast in the SLC. The three or four of you who decide to opt out of visiting will not be missed. And it is three or four of you, because I see a lot of people, and by people I mean dudes, that love the desnudas. And men are accustomed to dropping money when they see a woman's breast, and so they're paying for the experience. It wouldn't surprise me to find the real source of these complaints are the costume characters are losing money to the boobiarchy. In the meantime, though, I want you to really think about the question, who is this really hurting? Your kids? I promise you, they're not. They've already seen tits. I'd seen them by the time I was eight, and we didn't have the internet. So if they're old enough to know what a boob is, they know what they're looking at when they see them. If you're personally offended by them, don't look. Walk the other way. Look at Elmo, if you can stand the smell of his unwashed costume. God, he's almost as bad as Smelly Ellie in the summer. In the end, though, change the way you think. Take away from your trip to NYC that the human body is not sinful or dirty. That while you may not like it, it's not inherently wrong. What I'm saying is, free your mind and the breast will follow. Be booby blind, don't be so shallow. Oh, I did that way too early for the show. All right, fine. You know what? I will close it out. That's it for this local edition of the show. I'd like to thank Hypnostate for their music on the opening credits. You can find their work on Jamendo.com. Find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, for me, Dave Bledsoe, and all the fictional staff of the show, thank you for listening. Let's close out with this In Vogue song, which is what I was supposed to play here. I just really messed that up. Uh, hey, stay tuned. There'll be, a, uh, there'll be a podcast endorsement at the end of this, uh, which I'm going to go back and put something right at the very beginning. Thanks. See you guys later.
Hi, this is Dave Bledsoe, host of the What the Hell Were You Thinking podcast, asking you this simple question. Do you like podcasts? Well, of course you do. That's why you're listening to this podcast. Or, much more likely, you're a friend of mine who, who just feels sorry for me. I guess what I should do is ask you if you like good podcast, which begs the question, why are you listening to this one? It, never mind, that's not important. Look, if you like good podcast, one of my favorites is Too Beautiful to Live with Luke Burbank and Andrew Wast, available on the Infinite Guest Podcast Network. TBTL is... I had something for this, and it's really hard to explain, TBTL. Uh, TB, TBTL is Friends. There, that's it. Okay, the show is Luke and Andrew, and they talk about stuff. That... You know, whole thing where if you're flying the jet and you go through a flock of seagulls, well, you've got a dead 80s band on your hands. The conversation could be topical, it could be spot pop culture, it could be sports, it could be whatever's on TV this week. You just don't know what you're going to get when you listen to Luke and Andrew talk. And I was just kind of walking around this community just trying to find the right place to masturbate. No, um... <laughs> Okay, okay, it's like this. You know how you and your friends can sit around and talk for hours about nothing and have this great time because they're your friends? That's TBTL, except as an imaginary radio show. Then there are the tens of listeners who are the fans of TBTL, and they really are your friends. It's like hanging out with a bunch of dweebs who are really into the things you're into. That's the tens. The dweebs, you know. Our people. Listen to TBTL, and if you don't like it the first time, listen again. Andrew, please be patient with this podcast. God isn't finished with it yet. <laughs> and if you still don't like it, just try it one more time. Here, let me let Andrew explain how he gets through every show with Luke. As a fellow person who has constant pain in his chest, I think we can get through this together. <laughs> Support for this podcast comes from Microsoft Teams. The world has changed. And Microsoft Teams is there to help us stay connected. Teams is the safe and secure way to chat, meet, call, and collaborate. To learn more, visit Microsoft.com slash Teams. Support for this podcast comes from BMO. How will technology satisfy demands for a new level of order routing transparency? Why do you need to engage with a broker-dealer that can optimize the execution quality of every electronic trade? Unpredictable times call for expert insights. Read the article COVID-19 Underscores in Evolution in Electronic Trading by Anya O'Flynn, Managing Director and Head of Global Equity Products. Get her expert take at bmocm.com slash COVID. That's bmocm.com slash COVID. Electronic Trading. We work here. Too Beautiful to Live with Andrew Walsh and Luke Burbank, part of the Infinite Guest Podcast Network, part of American Public Media, and one of the best damn podcasts out there. Thank you for listening, and for God's sakes, listen to this show, because this was a totally unpaid endorsement of one of my favorite podcasts. Now, they would like to return the favor. Oh, come on. You guys are so much better than that. Don't even talk about it. Make sure you on the show.